Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Paul Milo. Uh, thanks for um, uh, your patience as we look to um, uh, to start the session. We've just clicked over uh, 7:30 now, so um, um, what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll start the the presentation. For those that are um, uh, just uh, uh, just joining us, then if you can keep on uh, mute, keep the video off. Uh, the video will help with uh, some of the uh, the connection issues uh, as well. But um, I'll uh, start uh, uh, sharing the screen so we can actually um, uh, see the, uh, the the presentation there. All right, so we'll uh, we'll kick start for um, uh, the session for tonight. Thank you for um, uh, for your time, and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll go through. So. Um, as said, uh, please remain on uh, mute uh, during the uh, the course of the session. Um, it'll help for everyone to be able to hear the, the presentations. Keep the video off. Uh, it'll make it um, uh, easier again for, for those that have got uh, weak uh, connection issues. Uh, questions are definitely encouraged. Um, we, we do have a team of people that are um, monitoring those questions throughout. Uh, Darren Anderson in particular will be um, uh, interjecting as a co-presenter. Um, and uh, raising some of those uh, questions that you do have. It's, it's about you. We want to try and get as many of your uh, questions uh, answered uh, throughout the course of um, uh, the night. Um, the session is being uh, recorded, um, and so that'll uh, we'll certainly be sharing that um, uh, widely, and I'll show you where that's uh, going to be available in coming days as well for those that, um, that are interested in uh, seeing it on the, um, uh, the website. All of our existing webinars are there as well, um, but it will be shared directly with um, uh, each of the clubs, um, um, each of the clubs uh, and, everyone's um, uh, and everyone's attending. So whilst we're, um, so whilst uh, we're online, online um, uh, tonight, um, uh, I'd like to pay my respects to um, uh, the traditional owners of the land, the various lands in which we're, um, uh, the meeting is taking place uh, tonight, appreciating that we're coming from all parts of Melbourne. There are a few people from regional Victoria as well, but certainly across the other uh, the metropolitan areas and pay my respects to uh, elders uh, past, present and emerging uh, and those on the call uh, today as well. So through tonight, we'll, we'll try and answer, as I said, to as much of those uh, questions as uh, that you do have. Um, we will end up with a frequently asked questions on our website as well, but please, please reach out to your regional contacts. Um, they're there to help. Um, uh, no questions, uh, yeah, a silly question when it comes to COVID. Things changed by the day and um, uh, there hasn't been a season um, like what we're going to see throughout the course of the year. So do, certainly don't assume, reach out, uh, we're, here to, uh, we're here to help uh, and your regional contacts. I'm sure will be familiar with many of you, uh, but particularly those in the, um, uh, the metropolitan area. We've got uh, three teams that, um, that span across uh, metropolitan Melbourne. The southeast, the east metro, and the uh, the southwest team. So, reach out to um, uh, to the team there to uh, to help supporting those from a coach and talent uh, perspective. Um, you know, we do have uh, Shane, Tom, and uh, Guy. Um, so, anything from uh, certainly that coaching uh, side of things, they'll be there to help um, uh, as well. So this is where a lot of the information, uh, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll take you through this in uh, the next um, uh, the next couple of minutes. But uh, but again, cricketvictoria.com.au. On the home page, we've already got information that's critical from a COVID perspective. But there's also the section there that shows some um, support, and right in the middle, that uh, clubs and associations sections. There's a range of resources there, and I'll take you through that in a couple of minutes. But um, but again, just to uh, to be mindful of that. So tonight's about, um, uh, one, it's about the Editable Association and Club COVID-19 plan. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll talk you through, um, it's, it's, it's a detailed document, there's a lot of work and a lot of hours that have gone into developing that. But by no means do, uh, do associations and clubs um, uh, need to, uh, to use that um, uh, plan that's available, but it's an editable version that clubs can use. 
just if anyone doesn't have uh, mute on, if you can just uh, put yourself on mute to make it easier for everyone to uh, to hear, um, that'd be great. Um, within the plan, uh, there's a training night uh, guidance, there's match day guidance, and there's also um, uh, details from a facility perspective as well. And at the back end, we will um, uh, answer some questions, but we'll seek to do that throughout the course of the night. So as we go, um, definitely ask the, the questions in the chat function. Um, we, we've got uh, a number of people online tonight, so it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to take uh, verbal questions, but just put that into uh, to the chat and then we'll be able to, um, uh, to work through those, um, uh, those questions as we go. So I might now um, just escape out of that one and start sort of working through the resources that, um, uh, that we have uh, for, uh, for tonight. So um, I'll touch on a number of these here, but again, this is where the current um, uh, uh, return to train and play plan is. So clubs are being asked to have a COVID plan, a COVID-19 plan from their, from the council. They might be asked for, um, for, for um, uh, hiring a facility at the, uh, towards the, uh, the, the back end of the season, or but just also to guide the direction of the, uh, the, the club. Uh, and again, we know there's some uh, good ones out there already. We've seen a, a couple of associations. I know the, uh, the DDCA have put a lot of time into to one out there as well, and that's, that's fantastic. That's great. Um, our one's there um, for rougher clubs and associations to use. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, it, it's available now. It's on our website now. We will sort of talk through some of the changes that are expected. As we know, living in Melbourne, uh, we know that there's changes uh, each and every uh, day and each week that, um, uh, that goes by. So, um, so it's a matter of um, um, uh, being uh, aware that the current version is there. We'll talk through some of the changes, but we're already drafting a version two on the amount of changes that have uh, happened since last Friday. So this plan was released on Friday. There was information that was coming through on Friday as we were releasing it, but also over the course of this week, and we'll touch through um, some of those changes as well. But, but some of the work that we've done in the background, when, when COVID hit, just as a quick recap, when COVID hit at the start of the year, Sport Australia, who's, a, um, a, a, I guess, an overseeing group for all national sports in Australia, put together some, some core protocols for high performance and also community cricket. The high performance ones are what you're really what you're seeing on TV. Um, so what's happening over in uh, in England, um, what you'll see in um, uh, in IPL, what you'll see in the the, the Big Bash uh, this summer for um, uh, the WBBL and the BBL. Our state teams. I know our state teams have just um, uh, left Victoria. They're in quarantine at the moment. Those might have seen Steve Smith come back or go back to um, uh, the UAE in a hazmat suit. Um, they're getting uh, COVID tested regularly. They're living in quarantine. It's similar to the AFL. They're in almost on a, on a, on a different world um, to what we are going to see at community level because we don't have those sort of um, uh, luxuries of, uh, of every all the players living in um, uh, in isolation and uh, um, uh, yeah in, in that sort of quarantine environment. So the high performance protocols were set, and the community protocols were set. So we've um, uh, been required by each uh, state uh, government, so in our case um, uh, through Sport and Rec Victoria and Vic Sport, to submit plans um, that were appropriate for, uh, for cricket based on those Sport Australia guidelines, which we did uh, with support from Cricket Australia, um, and that was then uh, ticked off uh, earlier in the year. We've continued to adjust that, um, that guidance through the, uh, the, the course of the season as more and more information's come to hand. And it's recently turned into the editable plan that you see now, um, which is, again, based on all those principles at a state level. Um, Cricket Australia have, have been great, but ultimately, as they, um, uh, they know, it's uh, uh, all the states are directed by their, um, their health authorities. So in Victoria, that all comes from the Department of Health and Human Services. Each of the, uh, the various government departments then takes that and then puts it into their um, uh, context for their area, whether it's the Department of Education and Training, in our case, that's Sport and Recreation Victoria. So we then are, um, are guided by Sport and Rec, and we work with them every single week and are talking to them every day, trying to get um, uh, clarity on certain things as it, um, as it unfolds. So there's a lot of work that's done, a lot of hours that have um, been developed into the plan to try and help make life a little bit easier for, um, uh, for clubs and associations. So some of the things that, um, um, uh, that we know at the moment, this is from a regional perspective. 
Um, and this is the roadmap for reopening, which is really sort of taken when we moved into stage one lockdown or two lockdown or the hard stage four lockdown. As we know, the language from the government is now about reopening and moving through the various steps. So regional Victoria, is, uh, as everyone would be aware, has moved into this third step. Um, and I guess we'll talk through regional because it gives us a bit of a guide for where we may be going for metropolitan when it moves into uh, the third step. But this is where the, the, the challenges be um, uh, uh, for us to try and interpret the information is um, where it sort of calls out um, sport and recreation facilities closed in step one for regional. No mention uh, in second step and then can commence in the third step. Regional went quite quickly from first straight through to third. So they're at a stage now where there's guidance there and I'll talk through the sport and rec uh, guidance but about where they can have uh, groups of um, uh, 10 gathering. And I'll talk about matches as well. Matches are a little bit different, but sport for non-contact non sport, which cricket is, um, uh, and there is a difference between COVID uh, sports that are non-contact um, for COVID and non-contact traditionally, but cricket is a non-contact sport. So cricket in metropolitan can start um, at the same time. So that's the, the regional uh, roadmap. We then work through from a metropolitan perspective. So we're fully expecting, based on the numbers, that we'll move from the first step to the second step. What, um, what will happen over the course of the next few days, and this will inform our second plan. So a lot of information will come out from uh, what gets announced on Sunday, but also then the, uh, the, the detailed documentation that comes out from the Department of Health and Human Services. It's a really, it's a detailed, uh, complex um, detail. Uh, so from the Chief Health Officer, comes down to the departments, we should be able to see that information filter through from Monday. So the announcement Sunday comes through on Monday. We have to then go through and work out the um, other details that are uh, within this um, uh, within these documents that come out. So and there's guidance in terms of these sort of directions. So this is regional Victoria. So it talks about non-contact sport can can occur. Um, the the number of people that are required for that uh, sport can uh, take place. And then in terms of gatherings, which uh, which impacts training as well. So and we'll touch on where it's at for uh, for Metropolitan when we work through the document. But so from a process point of view, we'll get um, this might be the public document. We'll then get the detailed information and then we'll start to uh, to uh, to formalise our plan two, which will be released on around Wednesday once we get that confirmation in the early part of next week. Just got a little bit of an echo there. We'll try and hopefully, if someone's on, um, not on mute, if they can just make sure they mute themselves, that'd be great. So what we've done then over the past couple of weeks is um, uh, provided some guidance through the VMCU, VCCL um, and the VSDCO, the subbies, um, uh, to filter down to the network. So this was one that was provided on the 11th, where we provided the status as to where we we're at at the other time in terms of what we knew and then working through. So from a metropolitan point of view, we know that there's no training and uh, playing allowed at the moment. But um, uh, what we've, uh, based on that roadmap, the 26th of September is the start. So certainly the recommendations that we've provided is around that the 14th of um, November. Possibility for a practice match maybe on the 7th, but the 14th uh, onwards for uh, for matches. We're certainly, um, uh, hopefully it's not too optimistic, but we should be able to reach that um, uh, the, the targets on the 26th and therefore we can have matches start. But associations have got all that information from a couple of weeks ago and, and are obviously looking at their, um, uh, their fixturing structure. We then provided some further guidance on the, um, the 18th, but detailing the, uh, the information that we were still, still seeking guidance on uh, and we'll touch on where we've got with some of those. Um, there was uh, clear guidance on um, uh, spectator information last week and we've had some wins in that regard over the last week that we'll touch on. So we then have um, uh, to work through Sport and Recreation Victoria. So this was released last week. And as an example, it, um, uh, it talks through things like sharing of equipment being possible for recreation, but not sport. So we've gone through seeking clarity there and we'll touch on where that's at as well. Um, in the background, we've also had uh, the Cricket Australia documentation that we've worked through as well. From a Cricket Australia national perspective, um, they talk about adhere to your state guidelines. But uh, for example, with equipment sharing, it's no sharing of equipment. 
What we've been able to do in the course of the last week, though, is um, been able to uh, be, um, gain some support from the state government and therefore Cricket Australia to allow that. Uh, and we'll touch on that in a minute. But this here is where guidance was provided last week. As of uh, yesterday, um, from last week, it had no spectators at community sport. Through our negotiations with SRV and the Department of Health and Human Services, that has now come out. Um, so we're working through what that, um, that new guideline will be, and that may possibly change on Monday, but we'll talk through that information. So if anyone checked this website yesterday, you would have seen no spectators allowed. That's now taken out as a, as a change. So we continue to, uh, to uh, be guided by this information as well. So that sort of leads us to where our plan is today. Um, this is the, uh, the, the fourth uh, webinar um, this week where we've provided information. When we provided it Saturday morning to the regional uh, team, there's been more changes um, that have happened since the, uh, the, the state government um, uh, announcement as well. Um, but moving through from um, what you download uh, that document, it'll come to, um, uh, to looking like this, where you can type in the uh, your name of the association or club, Again, clubs can develop their own, associations can develop their own. This is just a ready-made version that has, um, I guess, all of the uh, the, the up-to-date uh, research in there. So it was version one and was effective as at the 18th of September, but every day there's changes. So the new version will come out um, uh, next Wednesday based on what we uh, see in Melbourne this week. So some of that is still being formulated in the background, but... Um, um, this is the, uh, the, the, the key content um, uh, that we'll run through. Paul, we've just had a quickly, just had a request to try and zoom in or enlarge the Perfect. document as we work through it. Thanks. Yep. Great. Thanks, Darren. Um, so that is the, uh, the, the, the date there. Keep an eye on this version control at the bottom. And we'll talk on the page that actually has the, um, um, uh, the changes. So anyone that's already working through the plan, fantastic. Anyone that's endorsed the plan, that's great as well. What we'd ask is when the new one comes out, just to re-enter the details there and take particular note of where the key changes are. So it's a, it's, it is a detailed uh, plan, and, and we certainly are not expecting everyone to memorise every word of this and have it handy at every second of the day. We'll talk through some of the key pages, um, but this is about the comprehensive plan that you can show to your council to say, we've endorsed the state um, uh, plan, that's been endorsed by um, um, uh, the respective uh, state um, uh, government as well. So um, Sport and Rec Vic uh, and SRV signed off on the early plans and it's continued to evolve and develop. So that just takes a lot of the, um, um, uh, the grunt out. So this is some guidance about how to use the plan. Uh, and there'll be some key pages um, for regular use and they're single pages or a double pager for match day um, that'll be, so the match day guide can be with the scorers. So once there's any uh, confusion, double checking that out. We certainly encourage the um, a practice match before round one, just to test the protocols as well. But that's again, something to, uh, to work through down the track. So have a, have, uh, once you have a look at the plan, have a look at this as the key. So once it's done, there'll be some key regular um, um, pages there. Next week, um, so this here was the changes to our document that was um, relevant from October 2 to September 13, and the changes that were made. So significant ones, because this became an editable plan rather than just some guidelines there that was a three or four page um, document. It's now a comprehensive um, plan. The changes that will uh, come out um, uh, early next week, um, uh, and it will sort of touch in the document. We, we won't necessarily, because some of the things are still being worked through, um, be able to give you all of the specific answers, but the spectator ruling will come out, and that'll be more based on what the existing um, DHHS ruling is for gathering of groups. Um, so it'll be more about social distance, keeping your mask on, uh, but that ability to actually um, get to watch um, senior games is uh, being taken out by SRV, which is, a, which is a great result. The other one is about the equipment sharing. Within the existing document, it says you can't share equipment. The new version will actually say, we, we don't encourage it, um, but certainly if you do need to share equipment, because we, under, we understand that's a massive um, uh, challenge uh, and we've worked very, very hard uh, with, the, uh, with Cricket Australia, to be fair, um, whilst it was their regulations, they were, they were really comfortable if that changed from a state perspective, if we had that support. So we've been able to get that support. So it will be that you, um, uh, you're encouraged not to share equipment, 
but where it's um, uh, required, there'll be some cleaning protocols and that'll be outlined in the document as well. So again, from a metropolitan point of view, we know that um, um, and the training hasn't really started, but um, but just to uh, to, to help um, for those that are new to the game or don't have the equipment yet, we still encourage it. Um, but for those um, that don't, there will be that ability to have equipment sharing. Um, so that's sort of a, a, another critical one. Face masks as well as extra clarity there for um, um, if you're batting, bowling and fielding, it's optional to wear a face mask. You don't have to wear a face mask because you may actually do a lot of running. Uh, at any point in time, even if you might be trying to hide at first slip, you may have to run down the third man to uh, to chase the ball. So that need to run uh, distances. But the, the the Department of Health and Human Services um, uh, talk about anyone that's not exerting strenuous physical air energy, uh, running or jogging, um, uh, needs to wear a face covering. And that's where we've adjusted the wording to talk about face covering. So it doesn't have to be a mask. Uh, for those that are um, wearing a mask and wearing glasses and, and, and that's umpires or coaches, um, whilst there is a, um, uh, a, a fog lens that, um, that you can get from places like Chemist Warehouse that, um, uh, to try and help if you wanted to wear a mask and a hat and a cap uh, and also have sunnies to try and help. Um, but for those that, um, uh, yeah, that, uh, that wanted to wear the face shield, that's possible as well. So these, a lot of these things, so all of these things aren't, um, an imposition uh, that Cricket Victoria wants to uh, to put to try and make things harder uh, for cricket. This is about what the Department of Health and Human Human Services say uh, is um, is required um, to continue to work through this pandemic. Um, we're in um, we're working with Sport and Rec Victoria. We're working then to say, well, this is what it could work uh, for uh, for cricket. And that example of players versus umpires. So players are exempt from the face mask whilst they're batting, bowling and um, fielding because of that running uh, element and um, the significant chance of them running um, fairly consistently throughout the course of the day once they're on the field. And therefore that applies to the DHHS wording. Umpires don't, will continue to advocate for that, but that's again the, the, the state government ruling on that position. So uh, we need to, um, uh, to comply with that. Um, uh, and we're also one of the other big things that um, we're working on in the background is, um, and it, it is a, a significant um, you know, worry for us, but it's again, it's outside of our hands at the moment, is that um, uh, the Department of Education and Training has advised our schools for ovals to be closed um, uh, until further notice. So we're certainly um, working really, really hard. We're talking consistently with the Department of Education and Training, the Department of Health and Human Services. They understand the impact on participation if schools uh, ovals can't be used. Um, so they're certainly um, seeking to try and find a solution for us. And obviously we will update that um, uh, as soon as we um, know as well. But rest assured, we're advocating for all of those things to try and bring cricket back to um, as normal as possible. So this here um, is in our current plan is the regional Victoria because we know in metropolitan areas um, uh, cricket is not um, uh, uh, able to be, there's no training and playing under step one. We're really hopeful that there'll be a little bit of relaxing there in step two. The end of the roadmap, there was nothing about cricket commencing uh, at all in any form of training in step two. Um, and it was only until step three. We're really hoping that um, uh, there is that allowance, even in really small groups of two and three, and that um, there's encouragement um, uh, to, to go down to the nets and all those sort of things. But we're just, uh, it's a bit of a wait and see over the next few days as to what the official ruling will be. We're aware that people are down in uh, nets at the moment. And certainly from a cricket point of view, we want to get um, people training as quickly as possible. And we'll provide that, um, that updated advice as soon as we can as well. So. This will be updated into a, uh, into a more um, uh, uh, visually a, a appealing or, or easy to follow guidance, but it gives a bit of a guide to, um, um, to what we had last Friday. And again, some of those things have changed um, from uh, Friday as we've spoken about, but to that step three, when we get back to being able to play matches in Melbourne, which is where regional Victoria is at at the moment, what it, um, um, you know, what it is like. So it gives us a guide Again, these may change from the state government by the time we get there. But outdoor training is permitted in group sizes of no more than 10. So if you've got an oval, uh, one oval and nets, the groups can be separated and you can have three groups at the one time. If you have two ovals at the one facility, that could be five. 
So a group of 10 on half the oval, a group of 10 on the other half of the oval, and a group of 10 in the nets. If you've got a second oval, you can have another two groups of 10 and have 50 training at the one time. But it's broadly in a sort of a context of keeping people 100 metres apart is the guidance that um, uh, Sport and Rick have uh, provided. They have given us um, an OK to have three groups. So um, again, uh, 10 in half the oval, 10 on the other half of the oval and 10 in the nets. We know that some of those might not be 100 metres apart from the nets, but that's OK. So we've got that um, um, support. We're seeking to split it even further um uh but um uh but that's all we have at the moment so if you've got a group in the nets and you've got a group of 10 you could have all 10 in one net if you wanted to but um you're going to have to think about uh, keeping them socially distant so potentially five in net one and five in net uh, three or two if you've only got two nets but separating them will just help to sort of keep the bowlers at the back of the mark um keeping them separated but you certainly can have 10 in the nets in whatever configuration you've got. But what you can't have is uh, 10 in net one and 10 in net three or four, because it's too close according to the um, the guidelines that have been set down for us. As the season unfolds and as we get through, and it might even be really close to, um, uh, to round one, that may relax even further and uh, that ability to almost have everyone training uh, in a single group. But at the moment, until we get to that stage, it's got to be groups of um, uh, 10. We understand that it's 11 a side. You might have 12 or 13 in that team training, but the, uh, the rules are uh, pretty hard and fast. Um, um, so if you've got uh, 12, um, it may be that you, you need to split them up into two groups of uh, six. Six out in the, um, the field doing some fielding drills and six in the nets and swap them over. Um, those sort of things. But you can't have any more than 10. You can have a coach that um, supports that group of 10 so they can observe. Don't have them coming in, being part of the drill, because uh, that'll then take it over the limit. One of the things we have to be mindful of, and we've seen it, we're all living in Melbourne, we've, we've seen the news, um, uh, and we've heard the reports that um, uh, people in the local community will report what they see is um, what they see is unfair and what they believe is against the rules. And uh, people walking the dog or walking past, if they see 15, 16, 20 people in a group, that'll be reported and, and the police will arrive or the council will be notified um, and we don't want to see that happen. And we understand people making those reports because we still want to get rid of this virus. We want to um, uh, get back to normality as quickly as we can and, and people are making those reports. So we've got to be conscious of that and we've got to be um, um, seeking to try and uh, keep uh, our own players and the community safe as well. Just on those groups, one of, some of the advice that we have. Um, now, you could have a group of 10, and it's a different group of 10 on Tuesday and Thursday, and you also train on a Sunday morning, and it's a different group of 10. And that's okay, but it's not ideal. If someone actually gets COVID, um, the Department of Health and Human Services will say, who, have you, who has that player been in contact with over the course of the last week, 14 days? And if it's everyone within that training group, there's a good chance they'll all be deemed close contacts and everyone will need to isolate for 14 days. So if you can keep those groups separated and keep them training in their same groups, it'll minimise the chance that others and other groups will also need to isolate as well, which will obviously be beneficial for them of potentially not contracting the virus, but also allow them more freedoms uh, than being isolated for around um, for 14 days as well. So uh, appreciating that um, um, that some of this uh, will be a little bit about down the track, but this is about planning for um, uh, for the training uh, going ahead as well. In terms of the the, the matches, um, what we have um, um, so for again from a regional point of view, uh, matches can start. So from that point of view, um, uh, from our perspective, turf wicket preparation can start. It's likely within the documentation that next week we'll have similar wording um, from a metropolitan point of view, appreciating that once we get to the end of October, technically matches can happen. We know it's sort of four to six weeks to get a turf wicket up. So what we want to provide is similar sort of clarity, unless if there's anything that prevents us from doing that, similar wording will be there next week to say, we encourage turf wickets to, uh, uh, to start working with councils. We'll look through if approvals are needed as well and provide links for, uh, for getting those approvals, um, but we'll provide that there. Last week, we had, uh, as I said, the ruling for no spectators uh, for seniors. That's changed. Um, so the, uh, the new uh, guidelines will be provided next week. Guidance toilets can certainly be open. Communal change rooms may be open. 
but we're actually recommending, particularly for training um, and in the early stages, to keep them closed. Um, indoor facilities and indoor areas help to spread the virus. Um, and also, if you're opening those facilities, they need to be thoroughly cleaned as well. So just the cleaning costs and time associated with opening those facilities, as well as the potential for spreading the virus, we're suggesting to uh, to limit it wherever you can to uh, to toilets because it'll just make it easier for uh, for the clubs. But they can be open. It's a club call, but checking in with your council as well. Canteens can be opened as well. And we have links in the documents to um, uh, to talk about um, uh, canteens, kiosks, and um, how many people can be in internal rooms as well. But this is another big one, and particularly for metropolitan areas, the current guidance from the Department of Education for Training uh, and for Term 4 uh, is about uh, closing those facilities. We'll keep working really hard to make sure that's um, um, uh, relaxed, uh, but um, at the moment, you just need to check in with your school and keep updated with your school about what um, uh, their protocols will be. At the moment, we know there's some um, border uh, competitions out there and um, the challenge is, under the state government uh, rulings, uh, cricket is not a, uh, a reason for going across the border um, between uh, metropolitan and regional areas. We certainly expect that by um, uh, the end of October, uh, once we get into matches, that'll be eased. But again, um, uh, we, we will need to be guided by the, uh, the state government on that regard as well. New South Wales border residents uh, have a permit, not as relevant. Um, so again, this is based on current guidance for regional Victoria as at last Friday, um, as at the document that uh, we'd, um, uh, we had from SRV, but there's been some key changes. So um, what, um, what it requires uh, from a plan perspective um, is again, the commitment from a club um, to, uh, to ensure that we do play our role um, to help reduce the spread. We want to get back to, uh, to playing cricket, and it's, and it's very exciting that regional Victoria will come up um, soon. Metro will come up soon as well, obviously shattering for the winter codes that they weren't able to play and those people that were connected to, uh, to those winter sports. But we're really thankful that cricket will be able to uh, start soon. But we've got to make sure that we do our part to make sure that it gets through the entire season and not trying to cut corners, not trying to, uh, to find loopholes, Let's do it right, let's work together and we'll be able to, uh, to make sure that we get the season in. So there's some guidance there. Um, there's some, some links that we've, um, that we've got in relation to um, uh, uh, some COVID training. So just about the actual COVID virus as well. Um, having at least one person, we actually think multiple people from the one club, as it says there, uh, to support. So one from each team, because one person can't be at, uh, at every ground. And we'll talk through some of the attendance registers uh, and other things as we uh, move along. Darren, has there been any uh, key yeah. questions there? That we, there's been plenty on? of questions and, and we've been able to, to cover off on most of them, noting that a, a fair bit of the information will be covered um, as we work through the document. One that Claire has brought up is that um, under 10s will be at school and be able to be in bigger groups um, than 10. So hopefully Cricket Victoria can let them train in, in numbers of, of plus 10. And we understand that. But um, however, the, the difference is the fact that um, the, the kids will be in a school setting. So we know that kids can be 140 deep in a, in a playground um, and, and that's fine um, with regards to the school rules. However, once they then move outside of the school setting and they're in a community environment with volunteers running programs, that's where the requirements come in and uh, you can't be in any more than groups of 10. This isn't a Cricket Victoria rule. This is actually a state government rule. So we're just following the guidance that we've been given and the requirements that um, need to take place in terms of, of training and, and group sizes. So there is yeah. a significant difference between the, the school setting and the community cricket setting. Spot on. Uh, my wife's a prep teacher and uh, she's of the same mindset. Um, crazy if you can see 150 uh, kids in uh, prep all playing together. Uh, they can sit into the class um, less than a, um, a metre away. Um, but once they get uh, outside of the school environment, schools obviously can't um, socially distance and, and that's broadly the guidance. We'd love it to be the same rules for those uh, 12 and under. Obviously, from a Woolworths Cricket Blast perspective and um, the juniors, the amount of teams that we've uh, got out there, We'll keep advocating for that um, and we'll keep um, you know, certainly speaking to the state government about um, the inconsistencies there, but that's the current rules as they, uh, as they stand. 
Yeah, and uh, and Jan Martin's just asked: Has the, the state government specified the, specified the hundred metres between groups? Um, at this stage, Jan, that's what is the the guidance uh, in terms of, of training groups, and it's what was kind of in place for the winter codes, um, and uh, and then obviously some other sports around golf and and that sort of thing. We're being told that they will more than likely look to relax that. However, the guidance is still that no more than two groups per oval. And, um, and then obviously one in the net. So if, if clubs have two ovals next to each other in nets, well, then they can have two groups per oval and then one in the nets being five. There's only one oval in the nets. It's two on the oval and one in the nets being three groups. Um, that's the recommendation, the guidance we're being given. And it's almost uh, it's designed on, if you sort of think of the St Kilda foreshore and uh, just public uh, open big spaces, that they've used that 100 metres to keep groups apart. So it's not to have... Uh, multiple groups all coming together and uh, um uh but um yeah so the that's that, that's absolutely the guidance we've um we've asked that question we've asked whether or not we can actually have four groups on the oval and split them almost into the pockets of a footy ground if um so to speak but at the moment it's only um uh, two we understand the the the, the massive impost uh, that has and the challenges but also um, rest assured that we're chipping away at this. Um, uh, it's not our ruling, but we will um, certainly advocate daily uh, to try and get that overturned. So as it gets closer uh, to season starting and certainly closer towards Christmas, a lot of that becomes relaxed. So this isn't something to try and think that's going to be the entirety of the season, but certainly it may be some challenges in that, um, uh, particularly in that uh, November um, period. If we can get started late October and we've got any program starting in November, until we sort of get to that next stage when group sizes can increase, it may be still a bit of an impost. But if numbers are good, we may have some um, benefit there and have some luck in, in um, guess, ongoing um, and negotiations. And there, there's a bit of a difference between actual training numbers and training in groups of 10 and the game play. So the state government have come out and said that game play can be played with however many minimum number of players are required to play the game. So obviously, in most cricket circumstances, that's 11. Um, so you can have 11 players on the field per team. Um, for, for match play, it just can't be done during training. Uh, so that can take place straight away. Our advice is that um, in regional uh, areas that they start on the 17th of October and for metropolitan areas, it's the 14th of November. So the clubs can have a couple of weeks once return to training takes place to get used to the protocols and um, be able to get ready to go for, for the start of the year. So if um, we are to progress through to stage two, um, on Sunday in Metropolitan Melbourne, um, the, the requirement around training may not change, but we'll update that on the, the website as it happens. Um, it's not until we get to stage three, which would be two steps from now, that we can uh, go to groups of 10. So I'll touch on uh, now some of the rest of the, um, um, uh, the the documentation. You'll see there's a range of links in the document as well that take you through to, so this is the free 30 minute training um, that we're certainly strongly encouraging uh, everyone to uh, to work through. So there's a certificate at the end, it just uh, helps with a bit of guidance about COVID. It's a range of resources there that are available for, um, for the club. Um, but working in with your council, council are critical as part of this, um, and they've been they've been great to deal with. They've been obviously patient with the state government. Um, uh, they they've certainly been really uh, complimentary of um, uh, the uh, the efforts that we've um, uh, done to to uh, to stay up to date and to keep associations and clubs up to date. But working with your council because they're um, are critical as the other uh, the facility managers there. Um, uh, there's uh, information about um, uh, links to um, if you were to to reopen, how many can be in the any room at any time, and there's some signage at the back of the document as well. So again, work your way through this um, uh, at uh, when you get a chance. The training we've answered um, some of these uh, things here, and again, some of these things will change and have changed since the uh, the, the release of the document. Key thing that we'll sort of touch on here, which is just some broad protocols, and, and again, have a read through those. A lot of it is common sense, and a lot of it's um, stuff that we've been uh, doing on a on a on a regular basis. But um, so this is an example, whereas this says here strictly no sharing of uh, personal items and equipment. So there'll be some tweaks to uh, to this next version that comes out um, in terms of that equipment and what the cleaning protocols are. But um, but in terms of um, spitting, no high fives. This is a big one here, the no high fives, handshakes and other physical contact. 
as we spoke about earlier, what you see on TV isn't what's going to be available at community. So players in the BBL will be coming together, they'll be high-fiving, they'll be in groups, but it's important to reinforce that they're in a um, uh, in, in isolation, they're living in bubbles, they're living in um, uh, biosecurity protocols that allow them to have that contact, similar to AFL uh, teams as well. We've seen them tackle and uh, uh, have their um, you know, normal sort of um, rules, uh, but again, they're living in those protocols that community aren't. Um, so this sort of talks about um, uh, the over 12 to wear a mask, except whilst you're batting, bowling and fielding. So people, uh, uh, coaches that are standing around, if you're not running, um, uh, you certainly need to, uh, to, to wear, the, um, uh, wear the masks. So we have a one page plan, and this is where we sort of spoke about it. It's a 25 page uh, document and resource, but there'll be some individual uh, pages that uh, become uh, a guidance. So it's a matter of working through these here. And again, some of these are, um, uh, are changing as well. We've got a suggestion here. This will probably come out in our next version about every second net used. As we spoke about before, simply stick to the uh, the rule of 10. If that's uh, if it has to be one net because you've only got one, make sure you've got your 1.5 distance and you've probably got people padding up and um, all that sort of stuff. But um, you need sort of your bowlers to have enough distance at the back of the net. So if you use one, two, three, four or five nets, um, not a problem at all. So that'll probably come out for some extra guidance there. We speak about training in the small group sizes. So again, from a regional Victoria. So this is about, um, so once we get back to step three, which Darren spoke about, uh, hopefully that's in a month's time. Um, that'll be the group sizes of 10, which is what Metropolitan have as well. Stick to the groups. Groups don't mix at all throughout the course of the night. They can rotate between the different um, sections of the um, uh, the ground or into the nets, but get in, train and get out. That's a sort of the message that we have to have um, at the moment. We are in a pandemic. Um, cricket in a pandemic is a privilege, not a right, is, uh, is something we continue to reinforce. So the mindset of players, get in, train, get out, is a mindset that we need to have. So then behind this is a two-pager that really touches on a bit more detail about each of these. So this can be this can be put up, it's going to be laminated, um, and uh, uh, it can be put up at the training, uh, put some cable ties in it so people can read that, be referenced to it. I'm sure they'll be all over it with each week, and potentially with each week more things get uh, eased. But certainly for the first few sessions, have that up. Read this information where required for more detail about each of those points go through, uh, ob obtain the signs. There's a lot of free um, signs to put up, but you can, um, if you've got a local supplier or you've found any other signs, you can put up your own signs, whatever you like. There's uh, posters in other languages as well, but there's just a range of links to help you with a range of resources and signs. There are some for purchase um, through the Cricket Australia um, website um, uh, as well, some, some more detailed and thorough signage, but you certainly don't need to purchase signage. Um, Details here, we'll touch on the check-in posters later, but here's just more guidance. Uh, and again, read through those um, uh, at your leisure. When it gets back to, um, uh, from a playing perspective, again, we have a one pager um, that provides details about um, what needs to, uh, to occur. We'll touch in the check-in on arrival. So we need contact uh, tracing um, to, uh, to occur. If there is a COVID uh, outbreak, That'll just significantly help uh, the Department of Human Her Health and Human Services um, identify who is at the ground. Um, so we've got a, a QR code style. You can develop your own QR code, not a problem at all. Um, but we've got a template and a couple of options for, uh, for clubs if you'd like to, um, to use our template. But it's basically anyone who turns up to a match. The home team on a match day would have the um, other QR code. So the away team, the spectators, the home team, would use the, uh, the home club's uh, QR code because it's about who was at the venue. So if there, again, someone from um, uh, that was at that day uh, is uh, diagnosed with COVID, um, the Department of Health and Human Services will say, where have you been? Oh, I was at this ground for this match. Right, okay, um, that's notified. Yep, the club's already got it. Here's a list of all the contacts. We can get on to contacting them straight away. Um, that's why we do uh, need that. So everyone checks in, uses a sanitizer, um, and obviously then just work through keeping the distance, uh, mask on for anyone standing around. So anyone that's batting, bowling, of, you know, keep to your, uh, keep to your groups, all those sort of things. So this is again on um, a match day for rougher warm-ups. Um, uh, and again, if they're sitting around watching, 
the opening bat's made a duck and they're sitting there. Well, they're no longer running. They're sitting there. They're sitting down. So based on the Department of Health and Human Services, they put their mask on to watch. Um, so again, match day um, uh, one pager. Uh, one of the things we're talking is no communal food and drink. Again, this might be something after Christmas that gets relaxed, but that um, uh, the preparation, putting a range of food, people touching a range of food, all mingling together, that's not something that's going to um, uh, to help in the um, uh, the fight against COVID. So we're saying certainly in the, the early stage of the season, BYO or buy from the own, uh, buy from the canteen. So food and drink, no um, communal drinks. We'll touch on the um, uh, the number of drinks breaks, and there will be more opportunity to to, to sanitise the hands, more opportunities for um uh, for drinks breaks because they'll be every ten overs, uh, and or when there's normal drinks breaks and innings change over, etc but it'll need to be every 10 overs and that way the batter can go off, get their drink bottle, have a drink and uh, play continues on. But this is a big one and this is a big thing to get across. Keep an open mind. It'll look different. Um, there are protocols that we just, we have to comply with um, to get cricket up and running. If we said uh, no, no, we're not going to do any of these and it's going to be normal, we wouldn't be allowed to play. So we need to, um, uh, to I guess, take care of the game. We need to make sure that it, uh, that it goes ahead reinforcing that cricket will look different to what's on TV. Um, there will be a bit of extra effort, but keep an open mind. Let's actually make sure that we um, uh, that we get there. Similar mindset, get in, play, get out, is the um, the messaging that we've got. So we've got, this is a two-pager. So again, this could be printed as a double-page um, uh, guide for the match day conditions. Keep that with the scorer. And if anyone's then got any queries, they can actually just double-check this. So it gives reinforcement when you're off the field, you've got to wear a mask. We will talk about that's actually a face covering. So this will be uh, changed. Instead of a mask, it'll be face covering. So a shield is possible as well. For those that don't want to wear a um, uh, mask, a face shield is possible. On field, it's um, our players, it's uh, certainly optional, but unfortunately at the moment, umpires are required to wear that face shield or face mask. Equipment can be um, uh, shared and that's something we'll have there. Uh, personal equipment can be um, um, shared. Um, the match equipment, the setup of the cones and, and all those things, sanitise those before they um, uh, become um, uh, out on the, uh, the the ground. Coin toss, normally it's the um, uh, the away captain. If they've got the uh, the coin, they produce the, um, uh, the, the coin, they toss the coin, no one else touches it. That's the rule of thumb. But it took, this is a common sense rule that we've um, set up here. If the association wants to dictate that it has to be the opposition captain that supplies their own coin, we just know that it's a bit of a cashless society. Someone might not have a coin. So our message there is whoever's got a coin, they toss it um, and the away team calls. That's our position. Um, certainly there might be some different guidance from Cricket Australia. We're certainly encouraging you to use um, the Victorian uh, protocols. There's guidance from the Cricket Australia resourcing there, but they've also, Cricket Australia have certainly acknowledged that uh, whatever the um, state protocols are, they're to be followed. So we've worked through with the BMCU, VCCL and Subbies. Uh, I've all said that um, they've fully endorsed these match conditions and are, um, uh, and are asking. Uh, ultimately, it's for the associations, but they're saying associations, let's input these. We've run a couple of webinars with associations and they've been really, really keen to have consistent rules across the board as well. So... Um, so what we're saying is common sense here, uh, whoever tosses a coin, um, they keep the coin. If you haven't got a coin, don't hold up the game, toss a bat, toss a stone, whatever's going to work, but just don't share. But whatever the association rules are there. No sweat and saliva is a big one. Uh, people might see um, uh, when you're looking at international matches overseas um, uh, that, um, uh, that sweat is uh, put on the ball. Um, uh, and, but the rulings within uh, from Cricket Australia down and certainly supported by our health authorities, is no sweat and saliva on the ball. Uh, I know as a, a very slow, ordinary swing bowler, um, putting sweat on the, um, uh, the the ball, putting saliva on the ball helps um, uh, to swing, and it helps, obviously, to um, uh, to get a bit of movement, but it's also helping to um, uh, to, um, uh, to spread uh, COVID-19. So it's a, it's a clear direction from Cricket Australia, and uh, that's something that we've um, certainly built into um, uh, to the rules. So um, this talks about, again, so the match day protocols, we're a month away, at least for, um, uh, for matches, in some cases two months away. So um, just being mindful that there are some protocols, have a read through those. If you're not sure, work in with your association as to what um, occurs. 
We just ran a session just before about what happens with uh, team sheets. So we're saying no physical team sheets shared with the opposition. Um, put it onto my cricket uh, early. If you need to write them in the scorebook, maybe take a photo of them. But just um, uh, whatever the association has provided some guidance there. And we're calling out for clubs or associations to put a contact on. So when this is printed out, uh, people can then, uh, if they've got any questions, they can actually just um, uh, clarify that from a match day. So the attendance register is one again. We'll just um, jump, we'll just jump yeah, in, Darren, Paul. Great. There's a couple of questions that we'll, we'll be able to cover off and, and give a little bit more clarity to. So a few people have asked around functions and, and outdoor activities. Um, what we're really recommending is that you hold off on having any functions until after Christmas when restrictions ease. One of the big things that clubs really need to be aware of, and it's the, the, the big thing that we're saying, go check it out, is your liquor licence. So most liquor licences mean that you can't serve alcohol and alcohol can't be taken outside of your red line. In most cases, that is the interior of your social rooms or if you've got a deck, it's out onto the deck. If you were to do that and people were to take alcohol outside of that area, you are then in um, potential, um, you're risking your liquor licence, which is even bigger fines. Um, so do go and check what they are because we don't want clubs serving takeaway and, and that sort of thing if their licence doesn't allow it. Um, so that's number one. Number two is outdoor um, dining and, and, and meals sort of thing. Clubs can do that if they want a training. We're advising against it, but you must do so in accordance with the hospitality guidelines around how many people can be in a certain space and, and what you can do that for. So density quotients and, and making sure you're across those um, those areas. Next one and has it, come up. And if you're not sure, just on that. Yeah, if you're not sure on that one, just check in with your council as well. Yep. But um, and, and I guess a key one, as Darren said, planning for post-Christmas. We may get to a stage where you can have Christmas functions. Obviously, we're preempting what it's going to be in um, in three months' time. Um, so hopefully with each week and each month, um, numbers are good and restrictions ease. But certainly post-Christmas, we're a lot more confident um, uh, that, um, that things will be opened up. We've had a question around sweat and saliva. So match um, in the frequently asked questions area, um, we'll go through it. But basically, unintentional or intentional use of sweat or saliva on the ball, there will be a bit of a workflow where it's a, a first and final warning. The second step will be a five-run penalty against the infringing side. And then potentially, if it's done intentionally, the umpires may decide to call off the game and award the match to the team um, that didn't. Um, cause the uh, the infringement. So that will be outlined pretty clearly um, in the frequently asked questions and your local associations will be able to implement that and provide a little bit of guidance around it. And then Paul, probably the biggest question that came out and we'll probably need to go back and, and get a little bit of more clarification to provide an update through version two is for the, the games that get played um, with either Flix wickets or, um, or moan wickets into the outfield. We know a lot of junior games take place on that. So with regard to how many players are allowed out onto an oval, if this is the case, um, what we're saying with training, it's limited to two groups of 10 on the oval, um, but we may have up to four games taking place with um, potentially up to 44 kids playing if, um, if there's moan wickets on the oval. So we'll go back and get that clarification because we know it's really important for a number of different competitions across metropolitan Melbourne. And we'll, as soon as we get that advice, we'll provide it through to those competitions so everyone's aware and we'll include it in the, in the plan as we move forward. Spot on. And, and that also uh, is the same with Woolworths Cricket Blast as well. Um, so in terms of the Master Blaster program, they're games, um, and, and we're, we're wanting as many of those to, uh, to take place on the one oval uh, for obvious reasons. And we continue to ask that at the moment. The guidance is just basically groups of 10. Um, uh, to have two groups of uh, 10 matches again, it's the number for the matches, but we'll certainly be encouraging, particularly at the younger stage level, which is where it occurs. And again, the, we spoke about it earlier about the difference with schools. We get it. We, su we, we support that. But we're obviously working with um, uh, the state government protocols there. Uh, the, the other thing to be aware of is um, with the, regards to the equipment, the, the jumpers, the hats and that that Paul spoke about needing to be taken either off the field or to a designated spot. Um, we're advising we're going to have an umpire's webinar and we'll be advising them that you, you probably should be looking at allowing a little bit more time um, for this because games will take a little bit longer. The number of associations running one-day competitions have thought about expanding the number of overs to, to give a little bit more cricket, but then once they've seen this, they've realised that games will take longer and expanding the number of overs will only make the matches go 
that little bit longer. If the ball hits that equipment, as Paul touched on, it's a dead ball off the bat. But um, it's play on if a, a fielder doesn't want the opposition to score three runs and purposely throws the ball into a jumper. It's, uh, that's not a dead ball in that circumstance. Perfect. Thanks, Darren. Conscious that we're sort of hit 8.25. I want to try and cover a bit in the last um, uh, few minutes here. Um, the attendance register is essentially a contact uh, tracing um, process. So um, uh, those that want to do it manually, we would discourage it because there are some, um, some online versions for you to use. We've developed an editable version. Um, there's some guidance uh, here. Um, there's a process there that you can actually uh, follow. The Microsoft Forms one is the one that we recommend, and there's a simple step. We've already done a template. You can adjust questions as you see fit. You can put in the ground locations if you're a, a club and you've got multiple grounds, so they can do a drop down. So it's quite easy. It, all you need is someone that's got a Microsoft license, or there's another um, option there, which is uh, uh, AuraSafe. It doesn't have a checkout solution, but it's certainly better than um, uh, a manual option as well. So. Again, there's some pro a process there to actually develop that. And then there's a template there. So you can actually insert the QR code. You can put a logo on the side uh, and print that out. Uh, it does say contract tracing. We're going to update that for the uh, second one because it's contact tracing. But um, um, we're certainly the, the check-in and the check-out. Um, we also know, so from a, we've had questions about what happens with juniors. Um, parents can, uh, can do the check-in. They're dropping off for a, a son or a coach can do it as well. So it's just about... The phone going up scanning it then you actually type in the details for that person so if um uh um uh if kate uh hasn't got to run uh, a phone or she's un she's under 14 she doesn't have a phone um and if uh, uh, uh sally's there as the coach uh she can um uh scan in and um uh answer the couple of questions or ask the question how are you feeling yep no symptoms great okay you're right to go so doesn't need everyone to have their own phone what we then have is, uh, and we won't go through all of these because it's just general additional information uh, for you to look through at your uh, at your leisure. There's guidance about cleaning protocols, first aid. There's guidance about canteen and bar. Um, one of the questions we've had uh, is, uh, do people in the canteen have to wear gloves? The answer is uh, no. It's going to coming from Food Standards Australia. You can link to um, uh, to theirs as well but it's really about maintaining hygiene. Wearing gloves actually provides a false sense of security because if you've actually got um, a touch something in COVID uh, there, you're, not, you're gonna feel that you're invincible because you've got gloves on, but it could live on the gloves as well. So regular hand washing uh, is what's required as well. But there's again, guidance there as to uh, what's required. Darren spoke about the hospitality guidelines, the four and two square meter rule, um, which is something you just need to be um, conscious of. This will be uh, tweaked. We are basing it on the DHHS ruling and that page four uh, will have the new details that we've got this week from, um, uh, from spectators as well. There's more information just as um, uh, to work through um, at, your, uh, at your leisure as well um, that, uh, that provides a, uh, a bit of guidance. This is then the density poster. Um, so this is about how many can be in the social rooms based on the, uh, the two and uh, the four and two square ruling from DHHS. So you can actually just type the um, the number in here, um, and um, that'll be uh, based on the um, uh, the guidance you to get from uh, DHHS. Then there's a range of additional websites at the back of the um, uh, the document as well. The next version may have some additional um, information. We'd actually already drafted up a spectator um, guide, but if that's actually going to uh, to come out. That may not be in place. We'll have the Woolworths Cricket Blaster guide in the next version as well, and and, and more resources as they um as they come to hand. But but certainly the critical thing is don't panic that this is a 25 page plan because it's comprehensive and it should be because we want it to be your one stop shop. We want to make sure you don't have to uh, to find a uh, hundred different websites. It's all in the plan and you can link from that um that plan. But um but certainly. Download the um, uh, the plan um, when you get across. You, you certainly can do it now. Um, so you've actually got it ready to go. But knowing that there'll be a new version next week after the announcement this weekend, the more guidance we get early uh, next week. And uh, then certainly just working through methodically the first couple of pages as well. So being aware these are the key ones, printing them out to get a bit of a sense of these key training night in particular. Don't worry too much about match day, a couple of months away. How's the training night going to be run? 
we'll hopefully have guidance as to how it can run next week. Um, and we'd love to uh, to be able to um, have a ruling from the state government that yes, in groups of two and three, training can start. We don't know yet. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll be certainly uh, eagerly awaiting, and we've got a meeting with uh, SRV on Monday um, to really get that information as well. Have a look at this part of the um, other plan when it comes out as well, because that's going to be the key changes. Have a look at the, the this will also have for the new version, the link to the frequently asked questions as well. So check that out when it comes out next week. Reach out to your regional staff um, uh, for questions. We've tried to answer as many in the chat as we can, but some of those will be built into the frequently asked questions that we're building as well. So keep an eye on that over around the course of the next week once that goes live. Keep an eye out for the new plan as it um, uh, gets developed. But um, but yeah, we certainly uh, really appreciate um, uh, everyone uh, taking the time to dial in tonight. Um, uh, it's really important to get all this stuff right. No question's a silly question. We might not have the answer. We might need to find the answer uh, for you, but reach out to your regional staff to ask it. Don't assume. Uh, let's make sure that we get it right to make sure we keep the other uh, season going and can get through to um, the period when the restrictions are eased and we've got a lot more normality about training and how um, match day works as well. But um, unless if there's any other questions, Darren, that have come through at the um, uh, the, the last minute there? No, not, not really. Not really. We've had a couple of questions. Being a playing coach, does that mean they're allowed to leave their current group to go attend another group to provide um, feedback? Our advice on that is no. Um, if you're one of the group and you're participating with the group, don't go and uh, and then go work with another group. Um, stay with your group and have other coaches come in and um, and handle the sessions. So obviously from a distance, uh, um, yeah, so Darren's sort of talking and he's right. Um, don't have them join in that group and be part of that group. But uh, but if a coach is observing and keeping their um, uh, their distance and they, they might sort of yell out to that group or keep an eye on them, you know, if they've got three groups to, um, to have a seat, they've got to keep their distance. They can't be connected to one group, as Darren said. And with regards to the separate register for, for each date, if you're keeping a manual register, um, you will need um, one for, for every date, every training session, every match. Um, the QR code is purely one per club and you just enter all the different locations that your club plays at. So Sam, for instance, in your case, you might have Dendy Park um, 1, Dendy Park 2, Dendy Park 3, East, West, Central, um, and then the people just check into to whatever venue they are at and um, and you keep that throughout the whole year and it just adds. Uh, every time someone checks in, it gets add to, added to an Excel database through Microsoft Forms. And uh, it automatically tracks the date and the time uh, as well. So that's, again, why it's the one for the year. Um, so once it's set up, it's done for the year. Um, and you put up the same one at uh, a training. And again, the home team on match day has everyone there that, uh, that checks in. We had a question earlier about should spectators uh, check in. The example was what if they're um, sitting on the other side of the ground, just sitting in their car watching and not even going near the change rooms? That's probably a common sense one because they're, they're, they're not interacting with anyone from the club. They're not anywhere near it. This is about contact tracing. Uh, if, if the person that goes over and they buy something from the canteen and they check out the school book and they're connected. Um, so we certainly think having something up at the canteen. Um, so if anyone does come up, oh, can you just make sure that you've uh, uh, checked in as part of our protocols? People will be used to that for, uh, for, for restaurants. And um, so as it sort of continues to unfold and, and in Melbourne, hopefully we, um, uh, our restrictions are eased soon and we'll be used to going out again as opposed to um, uh, cooking at home and, uh, and having things take away. But um, yeah, anyone that's um, uh, coming past and going past anyone else, um, yeah, should be uh, uh, checking in. So if there's uh, no further questions, really appreciate you giving up uh, an hour tonight to uh, to listen to us. Keep reaching out to your regional staff, as I said. Um, certainly be, be be patient with some of the advice that's coming in. We're making sure that it's uh, that it's accurate. Some of the things we don't necessarily, you know, we don't want to see. We don't want to see schools close. We don't want to see um, small groups, and we're doing everything we can in the background to try and overturn some of those things. But Keep reaching out if there's some things that you, you really want us to ag uh, uh, um, agitate for, but um, uh, to speak to the state government on and to, to advocate um, for, for cricket, reach out to your regional staff. We're, we're probably already doing it, but, but don't assume. Um, so again, the questions that come through earlier, yep, we're absolutely talking about trying to get uh, more groups on um, uh, the, the field, and particularly the youngest age level as well. So we'll keep doing that, but um, keep checking on the website, keep reaching out to your regional staff, and, um, and, and, and we'll get there.
Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Appreciate your time. Great job, people. Well done. Well done, fellas. Thanks, Murray. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.